Thank you. This uh, nice introduction. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us and, uh, and for sharing your experience. And for me, it's an honor to, to have this conversation with you. So let, let's start in, in 1940. Um, France has been invaded by, by uh, the German, by Nazi Germany. Um, how did your family react to this, to this situation? Well, <coughs> um, when uh, France was invaded, it, it, it started in, um, I think the, the, the invasion was launched on May 10th, 1940. They launched a massive invasion that went from uh, Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. And uh, when France was invaded in June 1940, there was a Battle of France which, where the French army was defeated, the French government resigned, and a new government was formed, which was under the Maréchal Pétain, who was a hero of the First World War. He had been in the big Battle of Verdun in the First World War. And, and, uh, but he became, you know, he was senile, he was, he was 85 at that point, and he, he went along with the Germans, and he, capi they, you know, he signed a capitulation in the same uh, 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 rail, uh, rail car where uh, the, the armistice had been signed after the First World War in Compiègne, uh, which is a small town north of Paris. And when, when France was invaded, like in Paris, and the German army marched down the Champs Elysees, which is the main avenue in. Huh? <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Oh, boy. You get it? I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a new telephone, I don't know how to handle it. I, I apologize for that. Anyway. Uh, so when. Uh, France was invaded. The, the, the population from northern France, not only Paris, but northern France, uh, went south. It was a called a mass. It was a, a called l'exode. It was a ma massive exodus. <laughs> Live program. I'm sorry about that. Je ne peux pas parler maintenant. Je ne peux pas parler maintenant. Oh boy. What the, what? Okay, I think I, okay, okay. all right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize about that. I've ne never been very good with this <laughs> high tech. Anyway, um, so the, the, the people of Paris and the people from northern France went south in what came to be known as l'exode, the exodus. Uh, there were millions of people on the road, actually, uh, by, by car uh, and bicycle, in small cart, uh, on foot, by train. And we all went south to flee, uh, to run away from the German uh, invader. And, um, and we were under the fire of the German Luftwaffe, which was the, the German Air Force. And that's how my uh, grandmother, an uncle, an aunt, and two cousins were killed wh when they were strafed and the, the, or a bomb fell on their car. Uh, some of them, yes. Yeah, so, uh, my grandmother was victim of strafing, and my uh, uncle and aunt were in, in the car when the f bomb fell on the car on the bridge in Orléans, which is a, a town about uh, 60 miles south of Paris. That was our first uh, tragedy in the, uh, during that, that war, actually. And uh, my mother told me at one point that we, were, we even slept in a chateau. Of course, it was <laughs> nothing. It was not uh, uh, first class or anything like that. We were sleeping on the floor, and my mother had nothing to feed me. I was just two years old, and I was crying. And I was disturbing, you know, bothering everyone. So at one point, my mother told me, all I'm telling you now about this exodus is what I got from my mother. Uh, there was a soldier among, among the, the people who, who ran away like that. There was a soldier who had a small bottle of schnapps, and he gave my mother a small shot of schnapps and said, give him that, that will mm -hmm. calm him down. <laughs> that was my first, my first uh, uh, experience with, uh, 
schnapps. <laughs> <laughs> Two years old. <laughs> anyway, uh, but that, that uh, s s did uh, its job. Actually, apparently, I calmed down. So uh, we stayed a few days like that. And uh, at one point, we went further down in a small house also. And eventually, having nowhere, nowhere else to go, because we, my parents had no money, uh, and uh, we didn't have any relatives in the States or in Canada or anywhere uh, that we would have been able to turn to. So uh, there, was no, there was no option. We had to go back home. So we did. And that's uh, when we started to be subjected to the uh, Statute of the Jews, which was a set of rules that were patterned after the Nuremberg laws in Germany. Okay. which were depriving the Jews of most of their basic rights. So, so in France, you, you went back to Paris, and in France there were anti-Jewish measures, anti-Jewish um, laws. Yes. Could you tell us more on how that, um, what that meant then, well, and, and the, how the, the you know, were uh, affected? These rules, uh, you know, we, for us, it, it, it didn't... You know, it was basically the, the, these, rule, these laws were the statute of the Jews were depriving the Jews of most of their basic rights. For for us, uh, you know, it, you know, the, the, they said that the, the the lawyers were not allowed to practice law, doctors were not allowed to practice medicine, and things like that. For us, it didn't make any difference. But we were not allowed to to go into public transportation. We were not allowed to go to uh, theaters or movies or anything like that. It was very dangerous because they would uh, go there and they check identities and they would take away all the Jews. So uh, that was basically what it was. But I, my mother told me, at another story that she told me that I had no recollection, that one day she had to, and she had to go to run an errand in Paris and we had to take the metro. And I was just a little child, so I had no recollection of that. But when we came out of the uh, train, we were at the end of the line, and there was an identity check. An identity check meant, you know, since they had, the, at the beginning of the war, they had performed a census, and they had uh, registered everyone. And the, the Jews had a stamp marked Juif or Jewish or J on their identity card. Uh, when they were I, uh, checking identities, uh, if my mother had shown her identity card, chances are I wouldn't be here today. Uh, she managed to pass, you know, she pretended to look into her purse for a, a, a card. She walked between two police and they didn't stop her. If they had stopped her, that would have been the, the end of my story. Um, so uh, we, we survived that way, but it was, you know, by the skin of the tooth, actually. And, um, and we had a, a couple of close calls like that that I will tell you further uh, down on my story. So uh, that's how it was. Okay. So, so I have in my, in my um, notes here and some of my research that your family were forced to move to a, a small apartment, yes. to a two-room Yes. What apartment. Yes. What happened is that uh, my father was working in a mm. garment factory, and the owner of this factory was a Jew, and that meant that when the, the, Nuren, the statute of the Jews was uh, passed in France, uh, the companies that belonged to Jews were confiscated and they put an Aryan manager and the, the, the owner of the factory had to go into hiding also, he, he ran away. And we were living in the janitor's apartment. That was the, an agreement between the the owner of the company and, and my father, who was the accountant in the company, was doing the pay of the, uh, the employees. So um, when uh, the, the owner was, when the, the factory was confiscated, we were expelled, we were living in the janitor's apartment and we were expelled from that apartment. And we had to find an apartment. It was in July 1942. And from then on, I remember everything. All I am going to tell you from 19, from July 1942 is my recollection, okay? It's no longer what my mother told me. And uh, I remember that we had to move into this uh, small apartment with very basic comfort. We had uh, uh, only cold water. We had no bathroom. We had just a, a sink. 
that was it, and two rooms, not two bedrooms, two rooms. Two rooms, okay. two rooms a tiny kitchen, and a, uh, a toilet. That was it. And, well, you know, that's the, the, the best we could find, and then uh, we couldn't find anything else anyway. So we, we started living in that apartment, and... Uh, so, so what did your um, parents decided for you and your sister? Yes. What, what happened then after you were living in that apartment? Well, you know, uh, already there were a lot of restrictions on food, and uh, we couldn't find, uh, you know, we, everything was on uh, tickets. We had the uh, ration tickets for, for bread, and, uh, you know, I, I remember that uh, one egg was a luxury item. We, we didn't see eggs. You know, now we buy them by the dozens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in those days, if you could find one egg, it was an, a luxury item. So we had nothing to, you know, very basic, and the, the food was terrible. And uh, so uh, at one point, my parents decided to send us to a farm. So um, outside of Paris, b they sent us. They said we would be better fed on the farm. They didn't say to the ladies, it was two ladies who were running the farm. I guess the, the farmer himself must have been taken prisoner with the French army. I don't know. I never saw a, a man there. I saw only these two women, two sisters. And uh, my parents didn't say that we were Jewish. But I was four years old. What did I know about that? And uh, one day, and I was very social. I was talking to the ladies. And one day in the conversation, I said, yeah, we're Jewish. That's all it took to the ladies to send us right back to our parents. They didn't want to take any chances with Jews, hiding Jews, you know, because it was very dangerous for people to, to, uh, to hide Jews. Uh, they might face uh, execution, deportation, I don't know what, but it was very dangerous. So they didn't want to uh, take any chances with us, and they sent us right back to, to our parents. That was in the... We, we, spent, uh, we spent about uh, six months in that, on that farm. It was the winter of 42-43. Uh, uh, and I remember there was a lot of snow. It was, very, it was a cold winter. And um, I remember my, uh, my sisters coming back from school. They would go to school. I was staying with the ladies. And uh, <coughs> I was four years old. So uh, and I remember uh, the song, Oh Tannenbaum, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that brings me back to that period, actually. Uh, uh, anyway, and so, uh, so when I, I told the ladies that, and they sent us right back, we went back to our apartment, and then that was in the spring of 1943. So you went back, you all moved back to, to Paris with your parents. So w what was your parents' reaction after you all came back and, and why? My father told me, <coughs> he took me apart and he said, don't ever, ever say that you're Jewish. Because, you know, it could have cost us our, our lives, actually, uh, when these ladies ten, sent us back. So my father told me, don't ever, ever say, and that stayed with me for many years, even after the war, you know. Was it that I was afraid or was I was ashamed? I don't know. It was a probably a combination of both. But I, I kept it for myself. And I remember when I was 11, that was after the war, uh, I had an appendectomy. I, I went to a hospital. And the, the nurse was a nun. And, you know, she was taking good care of me. I was 11. So I said, have you made your first communion? And I said, yes. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what, what to say. And do you, did you go to Catholic? I said, sure, I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had to lie. I, I was ashamed. I was ashamed. Uh, you know, I, you had a sense of guilt about the way uh, Jews were treated. You felt guilty. You wonder what, of what. But anyway, it was a very strange feeling and a very unpleasant feeling. It took me until I reached about the age of 15 or 16 to open up, and, and then I started to really, I lost all my complexes about that, and I started to be very vocal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but before that, you know, I would see there, there was a, a, a brawl in, in, in the um, school uh, play, playground, uh, and people would use, uh, uh, 
and uh, you know anti-Semitic uh, slurs. I didn't respond. I was afraid. I was, I was afraid of saying that I was Jewish. It, it was like a, a stigma for me, and it took a while for me to to overcome that stigma, actually. So. Uh, okay. So before we got to when you were 11, let's go a little bit back. No, to, no, no. <laughs> to, to 1943, 1944, and specifically September yeah. 1943, when your father Benjamin was deported to a forced labor camp in the Channel Islands, the only British um, territory occupied by the Axis powers. What was your mother, Claire, um, what she, did she do? My, my mother was desperate after, because... After he was taken away. Yeah, she was terrified that at any moment they could come and there could be a bang on the door and people taking us away. And uh, so, uh, she, you know, she, She knew that it was very dangerous for us to stay in the apartment, but she didn't, she didn't have any, anywhere else to go. And one day, in the street market, she met this lady, and somehow she felt that she could open up to her, Madame Gallo, and she told her a story. She said that she was terrified that at any moment they could come and take us away. And the lady went back to her husband, and she, she, told, she told her story. And the next day, her husband, Monsieur Gallo, came with a, a cart, and we took whatever personal effects we could take, which was very little, actually, uh, with us, and we went to live with the Gallo family. The Gallo family were a couple, a Protestant family, a couple uh, with two young daughters. I was five at that time. It was in, in the fall of uh, 1943, and they had two daughters who were four and three. So the, it, uh, and Curiously enough, it was, to me it was like a, a vacation during that period. I, first of all, I didn't go to school, but that for other reasons, be, because my mother was afraid to send me to school. And, uh, but also, you know, the, the, I, I had this, uh, the, Monsieur Gallo was a, a sculptor. He was making uh, a, a sets for movie studios, and they had a big warehouse behind the house where they were storing all these, uh, 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 sets, uh, these um, uh, props, me, yeah, props. Yeah. <coughs> and, uh, and we had great hide and seek uh, games in the, in the warehouse, mm -hmm. uh, like that. I had two uh, uh, companions, you know, uh, playing companions, uh, and so for me it was, it was great. For my mother, she was under constant fear that somebody can, could, might hear us or might uh, see us or might report us, and uh, so my mother was always, in, you know, terrified. And uh, she is the one who suffered the most uh, from, uh, from the war. Uh, my sisters also were traumatized. They were older than me. They were five and eight years older than me. So they realized the dangers. I didn't realize the dangers. Like, for instance, if there was a, a, a raid, an air raid uh, with um, alert, you know, the, the sirens blasting in the middle of the night. We, uh, the, my mother had to take me out of my bed and I was bothered that I was taken out of my bed. But I did not, I, what does it mean to have a bomb that can fall on our heads? I had no idea, I, I didn't realize the danger. Uh, so I was more bothered than anything else, but my, my sisters and my mother were terrified. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, Yeah, it, it, it was it, it was very bad uh, from that point of view. Actually, I have in my uh, in my notes here. I did some research, and uh, other than that, what you just mentioned, uh, while you were staying with the Galos, um, you learned to read and write. That was your what you used yeah. to other things that you used to do in your pastime. Well, you know, I had nothing else to do, so my mother taught me how to read and write. I was. I was five, five and a half. So uh, I learned uh, to read and write. And I remember that was when I was with the Gallo family that I read my first page of a uh, uh, full, full page of a book. It took me about an hour. I had no idea what I was reading, but I could decipher everything. So that, uh, yeah. And eventually that, that, <laughs> that helped me, but in a different way. I will tell uh, uh, the next stage. So uh, we spent about six months with the Gallos. We would have spent We would have stayed with them until the end of the war, 
had it not been for uh, some of the neighbors who were starting to, to talk, and uh, there were some rumors, and there was a, a painter whose wife was a sympathizer of the Reich, and one day she came to Madame Gallo and said, when are you going to get rid of that scum? We were the scum. Uh, at that point, Madame Gallo and my mother <coughs> felt that it might be safer for us to, to go back home, which we did. Uh, that was in the spring of 1944. It was before D-Day or, a, you know, and we spent uh, a few weeks at home like that until one day at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was still in bed. My mother would leave me in bed because she didn't want to take me to school. Sometimes they would go to school and take people, the children away, and the parents would never hear of them again. So she, my sisters, it was a different story. They were bigger, so it was mandatory for them to go to school. But for me, it was not. So I was staying with my mother, and one morning, about 8 o'clock in the morning, Two police inspectors, Madame Gary, we came to take you away. So my mother's legs started to shake, you know, and, uh, and they said, I, for whatever reason, you know, I, I've scratched my head to try to find uh, the, the motivation of these two inspectors. Was it that they, they felt that the, their, 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 uh, their side of the, the war was lost? They, they had lost the war? or maybe it was just humanitarian reaction. Yet some, some police inspectors were showing some uh, humanity like that, but not many, unfortunately. So once again, it was you know, sheer luck. These two police inspectors told my mother, we're going to report we didn't find you, but you must not sleep in your apartment tonight. Because when we report that we didn't find you, they're going to send maybe the Gestapo or other police, and they're going to put some seals on, on the door, and if they find you, they're going to take you away. So my mother uh, woke me up. I, I was already awakened, but uh, she got me up, and uh, she dressed me, and we ran, and she was given the name of a social, uh, social uh, worker. worker. <coughs> and she, she went to see, and the, la the, the lady said, you know, you have to allow me a few days. I cannot find a solution like that for every one of you uh, overnight. So meanwhile, try to see if you cannot sleep at your neighbor's, but not in your apartment. And that's what we did. And um, uh, our next door neighbor was a communist couple. He had been summoned for a mandatory labor service in Germany and not reported for duty. So he was also wanted by mm -hmm. the Gestapo. And we, uh, we slept in the, their apartment. It was very convenient because both of them, Monsieur and Madame Ménétrier, were uh, working at night. They were on night shifts. So we would sleep in their bed uh, at night. And in the morning, when they would come back, we would give them the bed. And we stayed like that for a few days. Meanwhile, my sisters were staying with the lodge keeper downstairs. Uh, 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 mother, with uh, you know, once again, I, uh, I don't remember having seen a man in that family. Probably he had been taken prisoner with the French army. I don't know. But this woman was the mother of three children, two boys who were 14 and 12 or something like that, and a, a young girl who was uh, one year younger than me. And my sister slept at the lodge keeper, and we slept at the communist neighbors until eventually the social worker came back to my mother and said, I found a place for each one of you. My mother was placed as a governess uh, with a family of eight or ten children near the Eiffel Tower. And we were placed in a Catholic boarding schools uh, outside of Paris in a suburb uh, called Montfermeil, which uh, was made famous by a, a chapter of uh, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. That's where uh, Jean Valjean met Cosette, actually. Mm -hmm. For those of you who read the book, Montfermeil, it's a suburb east of Paris, and we were in Catholic boarding schools. My mother was in Paris, and she, you know, she, she was there, and she was on the front row witnessing the liberation of Paris, uh, because there were the fights in the, between the German soldiers and the, 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 the Allies, 
It was mostly, uh, actually in Paris, it was the uh, French Second Armored Division of General Leclerc liberated Paris. Uh, General Leclerc had joined uh, General de Gaulle in London, and, and uh, de Gaulle sent him to uh, Africa, and in Africa, with the uh, Second Armored Division, he, he took an oath that he would liberate Paris and Strasbourg. Strasbourg is a city at the border between France and Germany. And that was part of Alsace that had been taken away from France by the Germans in 1870, had been given back to France after the First World War, and was taken again when the, the German army occupied France. So he, pro he, he, made a, he took an oath of liberating Paris and Strasbourg. And he did. But there was also, of course, uh, American soldiers, Canadian soldiers, uh, British soldiers, you, had, you know, the Allied forces, even Australian forces, actually. And um, so uh, we, we were sent to, to these uh, boarding schools. And I remember the headmistress. It's mm -hmm. too bad. I, I would have loved to have her recognized as a righteous among the nations, but I, I didn't know her name. And I went back about 10, year, 10, 12 years ago to Montfermeil, and I recognized I found the place, I found the school. To today it's called Institut Jean Valjean, mm. uh, yeah, actually, mm. yes. And it, it's a, they are training seminarists, you know, the African seminarists who are going back to Africa to preach uh, the Gospels to African people. And, um, but I couldn't find the name of this headmistress because she was, I was her protégé. I was six years old. I was the youngest in the school. Uh, the children went from the age of seven to 14. I was the youngest and she was always holding my hand and I had a preferred treatment there. I remember like for instance, the, the priest in that school uh, was suffering from some sort of ulcer or cancer of stomach, I don't know exactly. And somehow they managed to find a couple of potatoes and a small piece of butter, and they made him some mashed potatoes. And even that he could not swallow. And I was fe fed the leftovers from the priest, mashed potatoes, and that was the best meal I had during mm. that period. Mm. And till this day, I love mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Albert, um, tell us. How was the life in, in, the, in the boarding schools? What did you do for fun? Um, well, you know, were you in communication with your mother and sisters? No, and not sisters? at all. I was totally alone. I would see my sisters every Sunday in church because, you know, it was two Catholic boarding schools. They were in one for girls, I was in one for boys. And we would meet in church every Sunday for Mass. And uh, that's all the, the, the contact I have with my family. I had no contact with my mother. My mother could not con uh, uh, communicate with us. She was taking care of eight or ten children in that family, mm -hmm. and she had no way of communicating with her own children. So that lasted for the summer of 1944. Uh, and um, August 25th, 1944, Paris was liberated. And uh, we must Be have before been... Before we get there, before yes, we get to, yes, to yes. August, we're still in the summer. One, one um, information that I have here on my, on my research is that you had an unusual favorite toy while you were in the, in the, in the, boarding, in yeah. the Catholic boarding school, well, which actually, was a piece yeah. of metal, right? A piece no, of our, metal. Pastime, our pastime in, the, in that school, first of all, it was summer. So it was summer vacation, and the, the children somehow stayed in the school and so did I, I had no choice. And so we were putting, you know, it, it was in the same classroom, you had different rows, different levels. And of course I was the youngest, so they put me with the babies. And I was making strokes like this, when I, I knew how to read and write already. But I was, you know, assigned this job of make, uh, writing strokes like that. And sometimes uh, when there was an, uh, a raid, we would go down to the shelters until the, the raid was over, and uh, the, then we would come out, and one of our favorite pastimes with other kids was to, to go into the playground and pick up all the pieces of shrapnel that we could find. I had a big collection of shrapnel at the end of the war, mm -hmm. which I brought back home, but my mother didn't wait to throw mm -hmm. them away, actually. 
And yeah, that's what, and it's funny because I, I wrote a story, I, I go to a class at the museum, I wrote a story about that, and there's uh, um, Harry Markovitz, who is also a survivor, he was from Belgium, he's one year older than me. He said, it's funny because two years ago I wrote a, story, a similar story about collecting shrapnel also, mm -hmm. so I, I didn't know that I'd done after, the, so we had the same hobbies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, anyway. the story is on our website, your, your story about the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. and yeah. it was published, actually. Yes. Yeah, it, it's true, we had, uh, you know, we had that, and uh, that's what we did. So, anyway, going so back, back to... Back to 19... Now, let's uh, go to 1944, uh, August. August. Huh? Paris, let's go to August 1944, end of the yes. summer, liberation Paris of Paris. Paris was liberated, and uh, after a few days, the train service was restored, and of course my mother couldn't wait to come to see us, and she came, and she was so appalled by the way we looked, because, you know, we were at, at that school, the, the, the headmistress was wonderful, and really I'm sorry that I couldn't get her name uh, to have her recognized as a writer among the nations. She was deserving that. I couldn't find the name, anyway. but uh, But other than that, the, the food was terrible. Uh, we had, first of all, it was scarce, and we were fed. I, rem I remember the most notorious was rotten beans. We were uh, fed rotten beans, and uh, I was constantly sick, of course, and I was weak, and so I lost a lot of weight. And when my mother came to see us one, uh, one morning, my sisters come to to, we were in the playground in the school, it was summer, it was hot, and they said, guess who's here? You know what? At the age of six, it's amazing how fast you can forget about your loved ones. I had no idea who could be there. And so I was curious, I pushed my sisters, and my mother was very short, was right behind, and when I saw her, of course, I jumped into her arms, but it took me... I, when she, they said, guess who's here, I had no idea that it was my mother. I had forgotten almost yeah. about my mother. And to this day I feel guilty about that, but uh, that's how it was. So my mother took us right away home. She took me the first day. She, uh, you know, she, she had uh, um, ration uh, stamps like that. She bought a loaf of bread. We swallowed the loaf of bread in no time mm -hmm. uh, with my sisters. And uh, so the, she took me the same day, and the next day she went back to pick up my sisters. Why she, didn't, she was not able to bring the three of us the same day, I don't know. But anyway, she went back the second day to bring, us, uh, to bring my uh, sisters home, and she left me under the custody of our next-door neighbor, ma ma Madame Menetrier, who had the key, and uh, she, every once in a while she would come and check up on me. And at one point, you know, I was always starving and there was nothing to eat in the house. We had no refrigerator, we had nothing like that in those days, you know, <laughs> nothing. And but there was a green apple, and that was the worst I could have with the, uh, my stomach the way it was. And I ate the green apple, and as soon as I finished the green apple, I was still uh, touching my teeth like that. When Madame Minetrier, I heard the key in the, in the door, she came and she said, what did you eat? I said, mm -hmm. Nothing, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, you know she found out that I ate the, the apple and she was very upset about that. But there were, it was too late. I had eaten the apple anyway. <laughs> so and so the next day. So therefore, the next day, my mother brought my sisters back, and um, meanwhile, my father was in the Channel mm -hmm. Islands between France and Great Britain, uh, in. Um, May 1940, about one month before D-Day, the, the inmates, you know, the, the Allies were bombarding the Straits of Dover to make the Germans believe that if there was an invasion, it, to, it, to, it would take place in the Straits of Dover, which was the shortest distance between France and Britain. So uh, the, the, the inmates who were on the Channel Islands further uh, towards no, uh, Brittany, actually, they were moved to uh, the Straits of Dover to repair the fortifications that were being demolished by the, the US Air Force and the RAF and all, you know, the Air Force, the Allies Air Force. 
And my father told me that at one point, you know, they, when they were raised like that, they would lay flat on the, on the ground. And at one point, there was a raid, <coughs> a raid like that, and they were strafed. And um, there was a German soldier lying next to my father. And when the raid was over, my father stood up, and the German soldier stayed on the, on the ground. He had been killed. So it was, you know, <laughs> I don't think they... Uh, really uh, targeted the guy in particular, they were strafing, and my father was uh, uh, lucky to survive, and he, he stood up, and the, the German soldier was killed. So, uh, at one point when the, you know, the Allies were pushing the, the Germans towards, back to Germany, actually, at one point the Germans put the 900 inmates on a train bound for Germany, were they going to send them to a, death, to a camp? I don't know, maybe just to a factory as slave laborers, as slave labor. The train was stopped in Belgium, in northern Belgium, by uh, uh, Belgian uh, resistance, partisans, who had blown up the railroad or a bridge, I don't know. And uh, so there was a battle and in the confusion and the, the Germans released the 900 inmates and my father, after staying a couple of days with the Belgian family to re recover some strength, being fed norm uh, almost normally, because uh, even at that time there was not much to, to eat actually, but anyway, to regain some forces, uh, some strength, um, he, he, he said to, to walk, he walked back home from northern Belgium to Paris, it was a 200 mile walk, and he arrived uh, the morning of Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish uh, New Year, and uh, it was also in the morning, and my mother was already dressing me to go to the synagogue for the first time since before the war, you know, because we didn't go to the synagogue during the war, and there was a knock on the door. And we were living, you know, in an apartment on a long corridor. It was very dark. You had a, a time switch, but the time switch was last, lasting just a few seconds or uh, maybe one minute. It was not enough. We were on the second floor, which here would be the third floor mm -hmm. because we had <coughs> Red Chaussee, which was mm -hmm. the ground floor, the first ground floor, floor, the second floor. And uh, by the time he, he got at, uh, to the door, it was dark, and it took my mother a few seconds to recognize him, first of all, because he looked like a ghost, actually. He was uh, gaunt, he, uh, he was uh, skinny, he had lost weight. He had that accident where he fell. Uh, did I tell the no. story about? No. Well, when he was in captivity, uh, he, was, he had a bad accident. He was carrying a trough full of uh, cement on a scaffolding, uh, along a cliff uh, to build bunkers, you know, these uh, pillbox, you know, these uh, uh, fortifications. And um, he stepped on a loose board, and the board came to hit him uh, on the forehead, and he fell off the cliff. He fell completely down, and he, he lost a lot of blood, and he was picked up by the soup truck, and he was sewn, you know, the best way they could, and he, he and he, to his death, he had very uh, big scars. He was bald, so you could see his scars uh, on his head, actually. So uh, he, was, he was not in good shape, but he survived. He had survived. And our nuclear family had survived. My mother had survived, my sisters, me, and my father, we all survived. But as I said, we lost my grandmother and uncle and aunt and the cousins during the exodus, and we lost a few more cousins who were taken away to, to Auschwitz who didn't come back. So that's our story, actually. So September, your father comes for um, Rosh Hashanah. Did he go with you all to... No, we uh, didn't go. You didn't go. We didn't, I, don't, I, I, I don't, re to I don't remember that we went to, to synagogue. You know, the, yeah. the, it was too much. Too much he, yeah. wa he was just coming home after a long walk like that, I don't mm. think we... Very long, yeah. And, and plus, I must tell you that uh, uh, my parents were not particularly religious. They were, were not religious, actually. But after the war, they didn't want, they didn't want to set foot uh, in a uh, synagogue anymore. Uh, my, mother wa my mother was willing to take us, and we went a few times with my mother. My father didn't want to set foot in a synagogue anymore. So... So, 
it comes October, October 1944, back to school. Oh, yeah. Albert starts school. And uh, tell us more about your experience in school. Oh, that was a great day. October 1st, 1944, it was back to school day. I was so eager to start going to school. I was just six years old. And I was very motivated. I was very happy. And I was a very good student, uh, at least in the, the first few years. Afterwards, it, it was OK. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the first few years, I was so motivated. I was so happy to be in school, to be treated like other children, and not to have to escape and to, to hide or uh, anything like that. So th that was a great experience, and I enjoyed school very much. Did your um, classmate uh, know that you were Jewish? Um, some, some of your you know, friends? Uh, we were living in this, uh, this apartment was a part of a huge uh, apartment complex uh, where there were a lot of kids and they, they all knew that I was Jewish because our next door neighbors, uh, the communists, they knew we were Jewish and they had a daughter who was my age. So every, you know, and uh, I had a friend who was Greek, my parents were from Turkey actually. So Greeks and Turks usually don't get along very well, but, but somehow, you know, they had so much in common, the background, the food, and everything like that. So we became friends with uh, this woman, and, uh, and I became friend with uh, a son who was one year uh, younger than me. And, you know, I, I was not living in a Jewish uh, neighborhood. There were some Jews, and, and I remember across in the other, there was two parallel buildings like that, and right across from us, <coughs> there was a, a Jewish family, and the, the, the man had been sent to Buchenwald, and he was the first one we saw coming back like a living skeleton. And um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that was our first experience with, you know, with people coming back from the camps. This man was a living skeleton. Oh. And I remember this. I remember this man uh, very much. But other than that, there were not many Jews in, the, in that neighborhood. But the people were very friendly. They were not anti-Semites in, in, in that building. You know, people were friendly. I had no problem. I was playing with the, the other kids downstairs. But my mother was always afraid. Because sometimes I, w I would be playing downstairs like that, and I was bothering someone, and they would say, Madame Gary, Albert is bothering me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she heard that someone was calling her name like that, she was always afraid. She said, if there's a, a police or anything, they might hear the name, and they might come and take us away. So she was constantly in, you know, afraid of this danger. I was not. I was a, a, young, mm -hmm. a, a young boy. Uh, willing to have a good time and to to play with my playmates. And I remember I w it was in that building that we witnessed the end of the war. The end of the war uh, happened one year later, in uh, May 1945, May 8th, 19, it was VE Day, VDA, actually. Yeah. And I remember it was announced by the sirens again that were announcing the raids, and we knew that Today, that day, uh, May 8, 1945, they were announcing the end of the war. And we were playing, and as I said, we were living in a long, two long buildings like that. And we were at the end of the building, and I had a friend who was one year older than me, was stronger than me, faster uh, running and everything. But that day, when the siren blasted, I beat him at the finish line. <laughs> you know, it's... Such the, it's it's hard to express, but something that was taken off our chest, you know, and uh, that's how it. Uh, that was my reaction to the to the end of the war. Actually, so we started running, we raced, and I beat him at the finish line. Wonderful. That was. So so we're gonna jump to 1990s, the 90s, when uh, through your um, application um, to Yad Vashem, Israel's official memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. Um, they recognize the Galov and the Menetriers as writers among the nations. Yes. Can you, can you tell us more about well, that? Well, actually, and, it, and I, you know, I had no idea about this, uh, this n notion of uh, righteous among the nations. And uh, I was working at the World Bank at that time, and one day we went to a restaurant with a, 
uh, a friend who was uh, living in Israel, he was, was, she was just a consultant with us, and I told her my story, and she said, have you ever thought about having them recognized as righteous among the nations? I had no idea what it was. I said, but well, give me, she, she gave me a name. I remember it was, it was a, a Totten name, you know, from G Girl Scouts. A uh, mm -hmm. woman, I forgot the name of the woman, I remember her totem, it was Colibri, which is a, a small bird. And so I wrote to, this, to that lady, I told her the, uh, my story. She, uh, of course, she submitted it to a panel there, and then they wanted to have confirmation by my sisters. So they sent the story to my sisters, and my sisters corroborated what I had said. And they were uh, recognized as righteous among the nations in 1992. I and I remember seeing, uh, because mm. I had lost <laughs> I'd lost track. The, the, gall the gallows had uh, retired and they were living in the south of France and the militaries were, had retired and were, they were living uh, further south also, uh, uh, down the Loire actually. And um, so somehow, you know, we had a small, uh, before we had the computer and all that, we had a small, what they call Minitel, it was a small uh, uh, sort of computer where you could find someone the phone number of someone. So I found Madame Gallo, and I called. It was in 90, maybe, 89, 90. I said, Madame Gallo, are you Aimé Gallo, the widow of uh, Gabriel? Because I knew that uh, Monsieur Gallo had passed away. Uh, the widow of uh, Gabriel Gallo, she said, yes. She said, I'm Albert Gary. Oh, she was so. Mm. And I said, Madame Gallo, I'm in Paris. I live in the States, and I... Uh, I, I cannot come now because I have to go back to the States, but I promise the next time I come to France, I come to visit you. She was living in Montpellier, which is a, a city south of France. And uh, six months later, I was back in France, and I, I, I flew to Montpellier, and we spent two days together. And she, she loved me like her son, actually. She mm -hmm. was so happy. and. And I told her what I was doing, that I had uh, them recognized as uh, righteous and all that. And she said, but you have to hurry. She was suffering from cancer. And actually, she died uh, six months later. But in 1992, in the spring of 1992, we had a ceremony in uh, uh, the south of France, La Grande Motte, which is a suburb of Montpellier, uh, with the mayor and some um, officials there. Uh, where they, they, were, they were granted the Medal of the Righteous. And the same happened to the Ménétrier, but then it was a, a couple of months later, I could not go back to France for the ceremony. It was in the uh, town hall of Paris with the mayor at that time was uh, Jacques Chirac, Which who gave them, gave them the, the Medal of the Righteous. And uh, three years ago, and unfortunately, the, both uh, the gallows and the Ménétriers have passed away now, and even the Gallo daughters, who were younger than me, they both passed away. But three years ago, I had the opportunity to be uh, reunited with their grandchildren. And uh, they were very eager to hear uh, the story about how we spent these six months with their grandparents, and what they did, and how much uh, danger they were exposed to, and they, they, you know, and they were very eager to hear the story. So it was a, a, won a wonderful experience for them and for me. So, right. So before we move to the audience for for questions, I understand that you have a connection with the museum special exhibition um, somewhere neighbors collaboration and complicity in the Holocaust. Can you can you share with us more about that yeah, connection? Uh, the connections. When I saw the titles, I said, "There's no way I am not going to be a guide to this ex exhibit." because our apartment was sandwiched between two apartments. On one side were the Ménétriers, who were this communist couple who saved us by uh, taking us uh, you know, to their apartment until uh, the, the social worker could find a hiding place for us. And on the other side were a couple, a middle-aged couple. Uh, the, the woman seemed to be uh, friendly, actually, you know, I was a kid, I was, I, I guess I must have been, uh, uh, I don't know, she, she, she liked me, and we were sharing a balcony, 
and there was just a, a, a iron um, railing separating her side of the balcony from ours. And one day, I remember my mother passed me over uh, to, to this lady, and she gave me something that I'd never seen before, uh, a yellow tomato. It was the first time I had a yellow tomato. Today is a staple, but in those days, I'd never seen that. So I remember that. But her husband, her husband was a militian, and he was sending people to, to deportation to the, to the death camps. And did they know that we were Jewish? According to my sisters, there might have been a possibility that they knew, and they somehow they decided to protect us. I have no idea. I, I think these people were very dangerous. And uh, actually, well, they were so dangerous that at the end of the war, the man was found in a movie theater gunned down by someone in retaliation. That's the kind of neighbors that we had. So when I saw somewhere neighbors, I said, I have to do this exhibit. Yeah. Somewhere neighbors is our exhibition, and I yeah. see it's located here in the lower level of the museum. You don't need any tickets to, to view it, and it takes approximately one hour. So we highly recommend you to, to stop by. And I know that Albert is a great tour guide. He won't be able to do it today, but he's a great no. tour guide of that exhibition. Um, so we have time for a couple of um, questions from, from our audience, audience and please um, uh, remain listening because after the questions, Albert will, will close the program with a few last words. We have two microphones um, for you to ask questions. Please wait until you have the microphone to ask your question. I'll repeat the question if necessary to be sure that Albert and everyone else hears it. Try to make the question as brief as possible. Um, was your father, uh, Benjamin, able to hide his Jewishness while the whole time that he was in the, um, on the Channel Islands and in Belgium? No, he was you, taken there as a Jew. As a Jew. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No. He was lucky that he was not sent to a camp in, in uh, Poland, because if he had been sent to a camp in Poland, he wouldn't have come back. Chances are he wouldn't have come back because he was very outspoken. And at one point he was asking his uh, fellow inmates, how do you say a uh, bastard in, in Germany? He wanted to insult <laughs> these people. And, uh, and uh, they kept him quiet. But uh, in, in, in Poland, uh, with the SS and uh, with the, the Ukrainians and all these people, uh, it wouldn't have lasted very long. So. Yes. Hi, Mr. Gari. Why did your father never want to return to a synagogue? That's a difficult question. First of all, my parents were never particularly religious. My grandparents were. I understand my mother, my grandfather, who passed away when my mother was a child, actually. Uh, my mother used to tell me that uh, he, he, he used to go to synagogue, and my uncle, who was his son, was singing in the synagogue in Ortaköy, which is a neighborhood in in, uh, in Istanbul. But uh, my father, my father had to start working at the age of ten. You know, he had a rough life actually, and uh, he managed to self-educate himself. And, uh, but and that's how he became an accountant, and he was taking care of the payroll of uh, people in the uh, garment factory where he was working. But uh, he was, he, you know, after his experience, he, you couldn't talk to him about uh, uh, going to synagogue anymore. That was it. And, and, and uh, you know, I didn't get any Jewish education. And to this day, I'm struggling, trying to read the prayers. I'm going to synagogue every Saturday, actually, every Shabbat. I'm struggling reading, you know. So I had the bar mitzvah when I was 13. I, I asked my parents, I said I wanted to be a bar mitzvah. They said, OK. They gave me a very basic training for that. And that was it. And after that, I uh, went back home, and that was the end of or experience with synagogues. And I, I remember when I was around 20 years old, sometimes, you know, I was drawn to go to synagogue. And uh, I, I remember one day I was, I was a Yom Kippur, 
I was at the entrance to a synagogue and I saw all these ladies beautifully dressed and all that. I, was, I felt intimidated and I, I said, I cannot go there. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't get inside. I was, I shied away, actually. So. I'm going to turn back to Albert in a moment to close our program, but before I, will, I would like to thank you all for being here. We hope you come back. Uh, we have our first person program every Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. It is our tradition here at First Person that our first person has the last word. Um, but before we turn back to him, for those who didn't ask, uh, had the chance to, to ask Albert any question, he will remain here by the stage and you can come by and, uh, and ask him questions. You say hello, shake his hand, take a photograph with him. Uh, we also have our staff photographer, Joel Mason Gaines, here, and he will take a photograph of the gr group of the audience, so remain around. And thank you, and Albert, thank you, and you have the last word. Okay, thank you, uh, Jaime. You know, I think this museum is a beautiful institution, and it's, and the reason why I joined, I wanted to join from the day I retired. It took me a long time to decide, to, to make, to take the jump and, and come. I, I did that about six years ago. I'd been thinking about it for a long time. Uh, the reason why I'm happy to be here and to speak and to speak to you and to speak to all the people that I meet at the desk upstairs and when I'm giving a guided tours of the permanent exhibit or of the neighbor's exhibit is I think the, there is a very important message that is conveyed by, uh, by this museum. It's that it, it, it's very important to uh, teach people about what happened so that it won't happen again. And the reason why it happened was basically hatred. And I am a very st strong advocate against hatred, against bigotry, against racism, anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, looking at people uh, with content because of the difference. I think people are so much today, they're looking at other people and uh, seeing the difference and being repelled by that. And that's very bad and that's why I think this museum is important and that's why I think my mission in this museum is important. I'm trying to convey and I speak at the desk upstairs. I always, when I have the, these uh, young kids from the schools, I always tell them it's important that you don't hate, that don't do, you don't look at people who are different with contempt or with hate. You have, you, you know, hate is the worst thing that happened in the world. Yeah, that's all.